Hello again. I had to turn the fan on. It almost gets pretty warm up here. Well, maybe that was a mistake. <laughs> Okie dokie there. Hello. <laughs> Pride and prejudice. I've been thinking about this for a little while, ever since Reverend Stephen you know, asked me to do the talk today, and I thought, okay, what am I going to talk about? And it's about consciousness this week. I thought, okay, what about consciousness? What on earth? And so I was watching something, and the title came up to, you know, Jane Austen's book and the movie. And I thought to myself, wow, that's pretty good, Pride and Prejudice. But when we're in Pride and Prejudice, it's not really a love story, is it? So the more you think about something, and we have that in this teaching, the more we think about it, the more we focus on something, the more we bring it into our lives, right? So you think you're not prejudiced, you don't think you're not really proud, and then the universe comes along and slaps you upside the head. Anybody else get slapped upside the head every now and then? And you go, ooh, now I understand. <laughs> Oh, my early 20s, I had just gotten divorced, and I was home for the weekend, and my hair finally had grown out to about here, you know, that was hard for me in those days. And I'd had my hair in curlers all day, I was going out with friends. Of course, you guys probably don't remember curlers. <laughs> we used to walk around in curlers, and I had one of those old-fashioned hair dryers that you'd sit under and it came over your head. I think I saw those coming out again. Everything goes around. My mom always used to say that, keep your good clothes because they'll come around again. And she's right, it's true. But I've seen those come out again. But you'd sit under the hair dryer with these rollers in and you'd sweat your rear off. But you knew it was for the good of you. <laughs> but anyway, I was in the bathroom and I know that I was getting ready to go out and I was seeing friends and I was going to have a really good time because I really felt good about myself. My hair finally turned out. I don't know about bad hair days, but I used to have a lot of bare hair, bad hair days, but it turned out really great. And I'm in front of the mirror, and I'm just kind of primping a little bit. My mother walked by, and she says, you know, pride goeth before the storm, or before the fall, I think it was. And then she walked away. Now, I don't know about your parents in those days. My mother used to give me little strippets, little, little, little phrases, but she never explained them. So I had to figure it out for myself. You know, like, never let a boy touch you. <gasps> or you're going to hell. <gasps> and you'd see kids holding hands and going, oh my God, they're going to hell. <laughs> so she never explained. And you know, later on in life, you know, as I've gotten older and so on, I realize that, you know, pride, when you take it to a point where you think you're better than someone else, that's when you fall down. That's when the universe says, whacks you and says, wake up. There's only one of us here. Anybody that you judge, anybody that you put that on, anybody you think you're better than, guess what? You're them. And they're you. There is no them and us. There's only me. There's only one. Now, that's concept, you know, when you're new to this, this teaching, the concept's kind of hard to kind of get used to. You know, when and they said that there's only one of us, I think of myself, I'm the one with Manson? Really? I'm really one with that person. And then you take the judgment out of the equation. It's not the easiest thing to do, is it? With people that have done horrendous things in life, how do we identify with that person? You don't have to condone what they've done. You just have to see God and spirit within them. That's all. Sometimes that's not the easiest thing to do, is it? Seeing that perfection, seeing that love, seeing that oneness when you walk by someone, it's not always easy. So uh, Willens Calcut, I tried to look him up. I didn't find too much on him. Does anybody know who he is? I love the, I love the, the quote, so I used it, but anyway, if you see anything in yourself which may make you proud, look a little farther, and you will find enough to make you humble. Quit looking on the surface of things. How many times do we do that? We only look at the surface of something, and we see what we think we see. You know, 
we project what our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, we project what we believe onto other people. Anybody have that experience? Projecting what you believe onto somebody else? Because they're saying something to you and then you automatically, something clicks in your head and you hear what you think you hear? Or you say something to somebody and they come back at you and you're going, I didn't say that at all. It's like, oh wow, I didn't say that. Well, yes, you did. No, I didn't. I apologize that you, th you took it that way. But they took it that way because of something in them that believed whatever the negative was. Any negative people in your life? I had one this week. Well, I had a few this week because I was concentrating on stuff, right? People that you can feel when you go next to them. You feel their energy? You know, you kind of feel that, ooh, and you all of a sudden want to just kind of go behind the potted palm. <laughs> I used to do that. I told somebody the other day when I first went, got into the chamber and I go to chamber breakfasts or meetings, I'd hide behind the potted palm <laughs> or whatever I could find to hide behind. It's true. I used to do that. And, you know, he said, no, you could never do that. I said, oh, yeah. And I'd watch people. You know how they get little clicks? You know, people would be talking and then these people would be talking. And you go to another meeting and the same people are talking and the same people are talking. They're going, wow, I wonder what they're saying to each other. So one day, an ambassador came up to me, wonderful person, it was Karen Troop, and she pulled me out from out of behind the potted palm. <laughs> and I was shaking in my boots. I thought, oh God. She's a big wig, you know. She's somebody important in this chamber, and she's talking to me. So she said, uh-uh, you're not hiding back here anymore. She said, don't think I haven't seen you. <laughs> she said, I've seen you at different functions, and you're always behind the tree. She said, quit hiding. We won't hurt you. Quit hiding. How many people hide? It's easy to hide, isn't it? You know, walk into a room full of people you don't really know and you try to seek out somebody you know so you don't feel awkward. Right? So she pulled me out from behind that pot of palm and she said, you know, we're just like you are. I said, scared? <laughs> she said, no, we feel the same feelings you have. We all have been through what you're going through coming into a room full of people you don't know. She said, well, let's take care of that. So she walked me around and introduced me to different people and come to think of it, my God, they were nice. And they were just like I am because they told me that. They said, I've seen you behind the potted palm. <laughs> I didn't think, I thought I was hiding pretty well. I guess I wasn't. <laughs> but they all were really sweet to me. And I got to know them, and they became family. Then I became an ambassador, and I started pulling out people out from behind potted palms. And I realized, you know, we all are insecure at different times in our life, are we not? Through different situations, we get very insecure. We don't quite know how to handle it. But instead of asking for God's help, instead of saying, you know, universe, I don't know what to do. I of my small self, I of my limited knowledge does it i don't know what to do but i know the universe does universe is infinite so what's infinite beyond anything i could conceive so i say help michael beckwith was having a a, a, a thing with uh, oprah you know one of her life talks or whatever and i i saw him i went by that on facebook or something and i pulled it up and he was talking about the first thing he does every morning when he gets up is he says help help really Michael Beckwith who knows everything right you think he knows everything he says help and he said it means hello eternal loving presence wow what a way to start your day help God help so why not do that when we're in a situation we don't quite know how to get out of or we don't know where to go from here. How many of us really know where to go from here? 
you get into a certain situation, you go as far as you know how to go, how, how uh, far as your limited knowledge knows how to go, and how many times do we try to figure it out for ourselves? How's that working for you? Doesn't work for me, because I keep going around and around and around in the same problem, and I don't get out of it. But as soon as I turn it over to God and let it go, wow, somebody comes into my life, something pops up, I see an article in a newspaper, I'm going, oh, that's what I should do. That's what I need. But how often do we do that? It's not until I finally let go that I finally realize, God, I should have let go two weeks ago. I would have had a lot better time. Humility. How humble are you? We think we're hum humble, don't we? Okay. There's no sin but a mistake. We've heard, heard this, no punishment but an inevitable consequence. You know, we've, I don't know about you. I mean, I've heard it for years and years. Dr. Dennis, I think, said it in my SOM1 class back in 19, da 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 And he said, you know, there's no such thing as sin. Sin is an archer's term, and it means you miss your mark. We've all heard that, right? How many times have we heard that? Several. And every time I think I, I make a mistake, any time I think of doing something that I think I have sinned, like pride, pride's a sin, you know. Loving yourself too much is a sin, you know. What the heck is a sin? Nothing. It's what we put the meaning behind. It's whatever we have been taught. Who taught us the meaning of words? Did you make up your own? I did that in one class one year, in my SOM1 class. We made up our own language, and we had to use our own language and treatments. Boy, I'll tell you, a lot of stuff comes up. It had to look like something you could identify. Why? It's your own language. Doesn't matter if it's XYZ, T2, or whatever. It's your language. Make it up. But boy, the roadblocks that we found in that and everybody found in that is the fact it had to sound like something you could pronounce, right? It had to look like something you could recognize. And it had to mean something that something else meant. I said, okay, let's make this easy. Make up a word for love. Make a, up a word for God. Make up a word for peace. Make up a word for joy. Make up a word for prosperity. Make up a word for whatever else that we usually use in our life, right? And every single week, people struggled. And I finally gave them a bag of letters and had them pick out six out of the alphabet. Or not, yeah, out of the alphabet. So they had to take six letters at random. And then they had to make their words out of those letters. Whoa, you talk about, <gasps> oh no, I brought the X. <laughs> oh, I got a Z, what am I gonna do with this? No vowels. Some people got all vowels. Some people got no vowels. And it was like, it was a catastrophe in the room. But what it did is it woke us up to how much we concentrate and we allow ourselves to be controlled by other people. We are allowed ourselves to be controlled what we have learned and what we've been taught in our life. And how many times do we question that? Your parents say something or, or you're, I was Catholic, raised Catholic. Anybody covering Catholics in the world? Yeah. However, you know, you believed what they said because you thought they knew, you knew what they, or they knew what they were talking about. But they just learned it from their parents and other people before them. They didn't make it up. How much of your life do you make up? Or how much of your life are you just following along? according to somebody else's plan, somebody else's idea, somebody else's words, somebody else's conversation. Think about it. That's your task this week. Think about it. The same mind that is in us is the universe, the same mind. No difference. Now then, we reflect into this universal mind what we think Practically the whole human race is hypnotized because it thinks what somebody else told it to think 
It thinks from a physical environment. What do you mean by physical environment? Five senses, right? You're thinking with about your five senses or with your five senses? We totally forget about the fact that we are connected to the universal law. We're connected to something so much bigger than we are that we can use it all the time. And do you know something? We are using it all the time, whether you use it or not, or you believe it or not, or think about it or not. Just like me thinking about this talk and reflecting on Pride and Prejudice for a couple weeks, and I kept getting hit in front of me. So what did that do? We always, 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 whatever we're thinking, whatever we concentrate on, whatever we focus on, is what we bring more of, to, more of into our lives. That's our teaching. That's what we have taught. But the thing is that, <laughs> oh, I love Ernest, good old Ernie. He said, don't let this be your only guide. Take this as a guide, not the end. We're open at the top. Think for yourself. Take what I say and prove it. How many of you here have proven that there's a universal law, that there's a mind that we think into, and it brings to us what it is that we think and focus on? Oh, come on, there's got to be more than that. <laughs> Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. We've proved it to ourselves, and then when we prove it to ourselves, we go, oh, wow, that worked. But see, it always works. We just aren't aware of it. We are not downtrodden, deprived, or miserable sinners born in the sin and conceived in, in inequality and shame. You know, how many times, how many people have brought up to the fact that we are born in sin, we are, we are conceived in shame, or whatever it is, and that until you're baptized, it doesn't go away? And we're raised for so many years believing that. Some go to heaven, some go to hell. That sound familiar? The lightning bolt's gonna come down and the day you die, and it's gonna determine where you go. <sighs> I priest, oh, I loved him, I was young. Believed everything he said. He told me once when he was angry at me because I always used to question him, especially when he said that my friends that weren't Catholic were gonna go to hell. That really bothered me because, you know, I played with them. I was out, out with them all the time. I mean, they were my friends. I wanted to be with them when I died. Doesn't everybody? Don't you want to be with your friends? Well, some of them anyway. <laughs> but he always, you know, he, he used to say that. And then I questioned him, and he'd get angry at me for questioning what he was telling us. That the Bible says that. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. It's an interpretation of the Bible that says that. But he always used to tell me, you know, you're not good enough for heaven, but you're not bad enough for hell. You're going to live your life in purgatory. <laughs> purgatory? Oh, my God, isn't that where it's kind of like, <laughs> nothing, nothing? I'm going to live my, my life in just nothing? Wow. So what do I have to do? Give up my friends in order to go to heaven? What? Even then, God was tapping me on the shoulder. But you know, we're not downtrodden. We're not deprived. We're not going to heaven and hell. Everything is a lie. It always was, always will be, but as long as we believe in the lie, it'll be with us in present, in the now. Think of the, the lies. It's another tale. I'm going to give you a lot of homework this week. Stephen will come back and you go, oh, thank God. <laughs> but think about all the lies you're telling yourself this week, all of the things that your parents told you about, that you took into yourself. Anytime I wanted to think about that, all of the phrases my mom used to tell me, a lot of stuff, come back to me. And I go, what the hell did that mean? Where did that come from? Holy cow. And I think about it now and I just have to, have to giggle because it came from her mindset, from her parents who went through the depression. A lot of lack, limitation, a lot of fear, a lot of scarcity. So a lot of things that she told me were all about that because it was proven in her life, throughout her life. After my, pot, my dad died, my dad died when I was 11, my sister was four, uh, 13. 
And after he died, she really pulled in. She was so, she was so fearful, she was so afraid. She had two daughters to raise on her own. Didn't know where the money was gonna come from. Well, obviously, my father paid off the house. My father had a lot in stocks and bonds. My father really took care of, when, if anything happened to him, he took care of his family. Because my mom never worked after that. Yet we always had clothes, we always had food, we always had anything we needed, and yet she kept worrying about and fretting over and saying, you know, I couldn't go and get a record. That's when 45s, you know, my girlfriend and I used to go to Lorman's, which was a big department store, three stories, my God, hello. But we used to go to Lorman's and we'd always go to the record department and she'd always have money for records. 33s, 45s. And I think at that, 45s were a nickel. Boy, am I putting myself out, aren't I? So I, wa oh, it was a little bit more quarter, who knows. But I wanted to go get the latest mu you know, music. And my mom said, no, you can't. We can't afford it. So I'd watch my friend buy her records, feeling shameful that I couldn't afford it. See what parents do to us? Now, how many, t how many things have we forecast into our kids because of the same thing? How come, or how many times have we brought into our life those circumstances because we believed it? So we brought it right into this present moment. Stop it! <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't hurt anybody's eardrums up there. Stop thinking about that. Let's know it is a phenomenal world. You know, I've read, I've read this quote so many times this week. We recognize when we are feeling we've sinned or feeling less than. Anybody that's depressed in here, feeling down, frustrated, angry, aggravated. So it could be those feelings are a nudge. How many of us think that that's a nudge to us? No, we just complain about it, right? <sighs> I don't feel, I'm down. <sighs> We don't think about the fact that God's trying to nudge you and say, hey, wake up. A request from God within each of us to examine and take responsibility for our thoughts and actions. They are speed bumps. The next time you feel bad, think of it as a speed bump. I'm going over a speed bump here. But the thing is, the trick is to keep going, right? You don't stop in the middle of it so you wobble. You go over it. You have the potential to launch into the next great possibility. How cool is that? You know, I think about the fact where I, I you know, I get all my, I am my yellow, I'm a minister, right? But I think, well, I don't have any prejudice. I'm, you know, I don't have any overzealous pride. I don't think I'm better than anybody else. And I think back to the fact a few years ago, I used to think homeless people we're just lazy. I don't know about anybody else in here, but I used to think, oh, go get a job or something like that when I'd see somebody with a sign. And then you'd read an article in the newspaper that, that, that these people are making more money than I was making in a year just by collecting you know, funds from people and not paying taxes or whatever else. And then about 12 years ago, my husband died. And then we had a downturn in the economy and I lost my business and then I lost my home. And thank you, God, for friends that helped me to get through that. And all of a sudden, I started seeing the other side. And I started buying coupons to like McDonald's and, and different places for food. And whenever I'd see somebody that was holding up a sign or wanted money, I'd give them coupons for food. I had food for the dogs and water in my, my trunk, so I always gave them water and dog food if they had an animal, or an animal, you know, cat food, dog food, if they had an animal, I'd give them a bag and water for them. And I remember this one man who was out in front of Trader Joe's, and he was sitting on a stool and he had a dog next to him. And he had a sign saying, I just lost my home and my job, and I don't know what to do. So I went over and I talked to him for a little while. We did some prayer and I gave him some food. I gave him food stamps and stuff for his dog like I had been doing. 
And he started crying. And I started, I'm going to cry. <laughs> so I started crying. And he says, you know, he said, I'm a professor. I have been for 22 years. And I lost my job. And because I lost my job, my wife left me. And because my life, wife left me and I don't have a job and she, her income was gone, we lost our home. And he said, I'm sitting here dumbfounded because I don't know what I did wrong. Wow, what did we do wrong in our lives to bring stuff in? And he started crying. We did some prayer work. I gave him some money also. I said, you know, the right people will come along. I, I promise you that. Believe it. Believe you're going to find the pathway that the right people are going to come into your life to help you move through this. Trust me. And I said, if you don't believe, know that I do. And I gave him my card and I said, call me whenever you're feeling down. Call me whenever you just have hit that brick wall and you can't get through it anymore or over it or around it. And we'll do some prayer work around it. And he was crying. And I left there feeling almost, oh my God. <sighs> I'm so grateful for the people in my life, all of you guys. I'm so grateful for everything in my life. He called me about a month and a half later. He'd run into some people from Moore Park, and he got a job. God works. You just have to believe it. Judgment, prejudice, judgment, doesn't matter what you call it, vanity. Takes you into a feeling of separation, and we see what we always have seen. We get out of creation, out of imagination, out of Im infinite help when you are, are in this state. So when you're looking at a person, like I was looking at homeless people or other people in our lives, I can tell you dozens of stories about judgment against people because of a deformity, because of, of an attitude, because of whatever. But as soon as you judge them, turn it around and look in the mirror because you're judging you. There's something inside of you that needs to be healed. God needs to be revealed here. Send them love. Maybe not out loud. That may be a little weird in some cases. But send them love. Send them love and say, God, I know that you're here, that you will uplift this person, and this person will be in perfect harmony with you and find the pathway that they need to be on. Do that. There, see, that's three. Three things this week, right? Do that from now on. We're all connected to different things. We, th we like and dislike, and this is all back to our perceptions, our beliefs, the things that we've been taught. Now, I, this, for some reason, this came up. Anybody else hear this phrase, going to hell in a handbasket? Do you know where it came from? It came from the, the guillotine era, era when they put, chopped off the head, and they had a handbasket in front they had to catch the head in. I know, really. <laughs> and they always thought that person was going to hell because of whatever they had committed. That's where that comes from, and that, that came up. But I want you to let you know that there are some great things happening. From the 1990s, there's some statistics. 90% uh, extreme poverty in 1990, it was $2 a day, you know, a pay a day. God, who could live on $2 a day? To 10% today. That's pretty darn good. We're not going to hell in a handbasket. So read through this. 250,000 people every day graduate from po po poverty. 300,000 get electricity for the first time. This is every day. 285,000 get first access to clean water. How often do we take advantage of what it is that we really have? Do you think twice when you turn that tap water on? Do you say, thank you, God? Do you think twice when you take a shower and the water's running or you brush your teeth? No. You don't think about it. You just accept it as yours. Lots of people don't have that. 85% can read now. It's more family planning. Hundreds of millions of children's lives have been saved because of medical care and nutrition. Diseases, a lot of diseases are basically gone. Thank you, God. 
So pride and prejudice lead to every other vice that get you out of that God state of mind. So anytime you're in there, just say help, right? Help. So we go back to our affirmation. So say our affirmation with us, with me, with us. All of us say our affirmation together, shall we? I struggle because I judge myself and others. Today, I move into a glorious way of being that embodies and exemplifies beauty, grace, compassion, and joy. All right, and so it is. Thank you. All right, I love the tree. Reverend Stevens started something a month or so ago about allowing everybody to call out who they would like a healing prayer for. You know, only the ones here, and make sure you put them in here after the service so you have somebody in your life or yourself that is going through something that they'd like prayer for. Just put it in here, and our practitioner of the day, John, will take them home with him and let the rest of the practitioner crew know what you're asking for, and we'll pray for you for the whole week. You had 10, 12 people paying for you for a week. I mean, my God, you're gonna be walking on water next week. <laughs> anyway, so anything or anyone in your life you'd like prayer for, please call it out now. So we know right here and right now that it's been heard. All we need to do is have the feeling, have that wonderful loving space of love in our hearts to send it out to whomever needs to be uplifted right here and now, for whatever for. It doesn't matter what it is. It's all God, and we look at it from that perspective from this point forward. It's all God. It's just a speed bump that we have a chance to get over, and the path is always illuminated in front of us. For everyone that, whose name has been called out, and everyone here in the box, we know that it's already a demonstration. It's already done in the mind of God. We now get out of the way and say help. And know, and we let go of trying to do it ourselves and know that God comes in. God comes in, oh, beautifully. And we already are grateful for the demonstration of whatever it is that we've asked for knowing this is the only truth that is, knowing that there is only one, we say, thank you, God. And together we say, and so it is. All right. <laughs>